Hi, my name is Vic, and today we're going to learn about gradient descent, an important building block of neural networks. Gradient descent is how neural networks learn from data and train their parameters. Today, we'll use Python to implement linear regression using gradient descent, and in future videos, we'll build more and more complex networks using this technique. All right, let's dive in. Let's get started learning about gradient descent. So the first thing we'll do is we'll read in some data on weather. And this data is what we're going to use throughout this tutorial. So first we're going to import a library called pandas that will help us read the data in. And then we're going to go ahead and use a pandas function to actually read our data. We're then going to fill in missing values in our data. Most machine learning algorithms don't work well with missing data. And we'll take a look at the first five rows of our data as well. So here's the data. And each row is basically a single day. And for each day, we have the Tmax, which is the maximum temperature on that day, the Tmin, the minimum temperature, how much it rained, and tomorrow's temperature. And our goal today is going to be to use gradient descent to train a linear regression algorithm that can predict Tmax tomorrow using the other columns. And we have a lot of data points. So we have data from several years, 13,000 rows, and we're going to use all that data to train our algorithm and make good predictions. All right. So now that we have our data, let's look a little bit at the linear regression algorithm and how it works. And this will help us understand gradient descent. So for linear regression to work, we need a linear relationship between what we're trying to predict and our predictors. So let's visualize this using our Tmax column, which we're going to be using as a predictor, and our Tmax tomorrow column, which we're using as a target. So we can make a scatter plot that shows the relationship between these two variables. And as we can see here, everything is in a cloud of data points, as is typical in a scatter plot. But it looks like there's kind of a line you could draw in the middle of all this data that would follow the shape of the data. So let's actually draw that line. And then we can talk a little bit about what a linear relationship means. So I'm going to go ahead and import matplotlib, which is a Python charting library. And we'll make the scatter plot again. But this time, we'll draw a line on top of the scatter plot. And this line is going to go from 30, 30 to 120, 120. So this line will have the same Tmax and Tmax tomorrow. So you can see that this line actually goes through the data pretty well. And we could use this line to make predictions for Tmax tomorrow. So we could look at our Tmax value. Let's say that today's temperature is 80. And then we could go up to the line and see what our prediction is based on the line. So in this case, the line is just setting the same Tmax tomorrow as Tmax. So the prediction, if today's temperature is 80, is going to be that tomorrow's temperature will also be 80. It's a pretty simple prediction. We can use linear regression to make a slightly more accurate prediction. And the way it works is by multiplying the T max today by some number. So what this looks like in equation form is this. So it looks like underscore hat y, which is our predicted y, equals w1 times x1 plus b. So let's take a look at what this equation looks like. All right, so in this equation, our predicted y, which is y with a little fancy hat over it, equals w1 times x1 plus b. In this equation, x1 is going to be our tmax today. So let's say our tmax today is 80. w is, is our, a value called a weight, which is actually what our neural network is learning. So let's say the weight is 1. And then b is a value called the bias or y-intercept, which is another value that our linear regression algorithm or neural network will learn using gradient descent. 
So let's say our bias is one. So in this example, our prediction would be 81. Now, obviously the magic of linear regression is that it will automatically learn W1 and B to actually fit our data properly. We can also use multiple predictors. So in this example, we're just using a single X value, but we can also use multiple X values. So in that case, you would say W underscore two times X underscore two plus B. So with the second equation, we would pass in T max as X one and T min as X two. And our linear regression algorithm would actually have what are called three parameters, two weights, W1 and W2, and one bias, which is B. All right, so let's train a linear regression model using scikit-learn. So this is code that's already been written and it's, it's already gonna work. So we can just use it to see how linear regression works. Later on in this tutorial, we'll actually code our own linear regression model. So we're gonna say from sklearn.linear model, import linear regression. That's the linear regression class in scikit-learn. And then what we're gonna do is we're going to initialize the linear regression class and we're going to fit it to our data. So this will basically train the algorithm using our data. So we're going to train it using our Tmax and we're going to predict Tmax tomorrow. So this is going to fit that linear regression algorithm. All right, and once it's fit, we can actually plot our data points. So just like before, we'll make a scatter plot of Tmax and our Tmax tomorrow. And then we can also plot the line that we just defined using this linear regression model. So what, what we're doing here is for the X value, on for the line, we're passing in Tmax, and then our predicted values for Tmax tomorrow are going to be the Y values. And we're gonna color this line green. So let's take a look at this. And the line is a little bit different from the line we created before. And we can take a look actually at the coefficients of our model, the weight and the bias to actually see how the line is defined. So let's go ahead and run that. So we can see our weight, our W1 value is 0.82 and our bias is 11.99. So if the Tmax today is 80, we're gonna multiply that by 0.82 and add 11.99 to get our prediction for tomorrow, 77.58. All right, so we now have a prediction for what tomorrow's temperature is going to be. Now, in order to make this prediction better, we need to actually figure out the error of the prediction or the loss of the prediction. And this is a really important part of gradient descent. So we're going to use a function called mean squared error to calculate our loss. And the formula for mean squared error is just this. All right, so, so MSE or mean squared error equals y hat, our predicted y, minus our actual y squared. So we call this our loss function. So let's say up here, we predicted that tomorrow's temperature will be 77.58 if today's temperature is 80. So we can calculate our loss. It's going to be 77.58, and let's say tomorrow's actual temperature is 81. So we predicted it would be 77.58, it's actually 81. And then we'll go ahead and square it. This gives us our, lo our loss, which is 11.69. So that's a measure of how good our prediction was. So if our prediction was closer to the correct value, like let's say our prediction was 80.5, then our loss would be lower. Whereas if our prediction is worse, like if we predicted 70, then our loss will be higher. All right. So what we want to figure out using gradient descent is how can we get to the place where our loss is the lowest, where our prediction is as close as possible to the actual value. So to help us understand how we get there, let's graph out our different weight values, our W values against our loss. So we're going to import NumPy, it's NP. NumPy is an amazing, amazing Python library that makes it easier for us to work with vectors. So think of lists or arrays of data. 
Then we'll just create our loss function. So this will take in a weight and a Y value. And since our X value is 80, we multiply our weight by 80, and then we add in B, which is 11.99, and then we subtract the actual Y, and then we square it. So our loss function will take in a weight and a Y value, which is tomorrow's actual temperature, and it'll tell us how big our loss was. And in this case, our Y is going to be 81. That's what we decided is tomorrow's actual temperature. So we'll create a, an array of a bunch of different potential weights ranging from negative one to three with a step of 0.1. So we'll get negative 0.9, negative 0.8, negative 0.7, and so on. And then we'll calculate the loss for each of these W values. And then we can actually plot this using a scatter plot. And then we can also mark where our particular loss value is. So we'll mark this as one, which is our weight. And then we will calculate the loss with a weight of one. And we'll mark this point in red. Okay, so this graph shows different weight values on the x-axis and the loss on the y-axis. And the loss for a weight of one is marked in red. So you can see on this graph that there is a point where the loss is the lowest possible. And it's very, very close to one. It's actually a little bit less than one. So our weight is currently too high. But if we increase our weight, like if our weight becomes three, for example, then the loss really increases. Also, if we decrease the weight too much, like if we send it to negative one, the loss actually increases a lot too. And this makes sense, right? Three times 80 plus 11.99 is a lot higher than 81, right? Same thing with negative one times 80 plus 11.99. This is pretty far away from our actual temperature for tomorrow. So changing our weight values away from a certain minimum weight value will actually cause the loss to really increase. And the goal of gradient descent is to get to that correct weight value, which is around 0.8, right? It's to help us adjust our weight so it gets to that optimum value where the loss is the lowest. All right, and the way we do that is we actually use something called the gradient. So the gradient tells us how quickly the loss is changing as the weights change. So we can see as we move towards the higher values, like where the weight is, is really high, when you go from a weight of two to a weight of three, the loss changes a lot more than if you go from a weight of one to a weight of two, right? You can see that the graph is getting steeper and steeper. And this is also causing the gradient of the graph to change. So the gradient is the rate of change of the loss, also known as the derivative of the loss. So we can go ahead and calculate this by writing another function. So this is the derivative of our loss function. If you know how to do derivatives, instead of squaring it, we just multiply it by two. And this tells us how quickly the, basically the function is changing. So the higher the gradient, if you change the weight a little bit, then the value of the loss will change more than if you have a lower gradient. And we can visualize this. in the same way we visualized the loss function. Okay, so let's go ahead and plot that. All right, so the gradient in this case is a line, right? But as you get higher on this line, so when the weight is higher, the gradient is much, much larger, which means if the weight is three and you change the weight a little bit, then the loss will actually change a lot. Whereas if the weight is closer to one, the gradient is very close to zero. So if you change the weight a little bit at this point, the loss won't change very much. And that makes sense when you compare it to this graph, right? The loss doesn't change a lot between 0.5 and 1.5 weight, but it changes a lot between two and three. So as you get further away from the, the optimum value for the weight, which is around 0.8, the gradient just changes 
and the value gets bigger and bigger. So what gradient descent will try to do is reach the point where the gradient is zero, which in this case is also the point where the loss is the lowest. This isn't always the case. Sometimes with gradient descent, you'll get to a local minimum instead of what's called a global minimum. But this loss function has a global minimum where the weight is around 0.8. Okay, so what we're gonna do is figure out how we actually update our weights and our biases to get to this point where the loss is the lowest. And to help us understand that, let's take a quick look at a little visualization. Okay, so this visualization shows us how we calculate our predicted Y. So at the very right side of this visualization is our prediction. And to get our prediction, we start all the way on the left, we multiply x by the weight, and that gives us x times w, then we add that to b to get y, which is our final prediction. All right, so once we calculate our prediction, we can actually calculate our loss or our gradient against that prediction. So we'll calculate the loss, and then the derivative of the loss is the gradient. So here's, a, here's an image that visualizes that. All right, so when we, when we make this prediction, so if the weight is 1 and we have an x value of 80, and then we add 11.99, this gives us our prediction of 91.99, which if we then subtract the y value, which in this case is going to be 81, we end up with 10.98. And then to get the gradient, we also multiply this by 2. All right, so this gives us our derivative of the loss, or our gradient, which is 21.98. So that's the number you see in red over here. Then we have to decide how much does W and B contribute to this error, right? So if we changed b, how much would our error change? And in this case, b is just added to x times w to get y. So any change we make to b is directly reflected in our prediction, right? If we add 5 to b, our prediction goes up by 5. So what we want to do is take the partial derivative of b with respect to our loss. And this turns out to just be the same as the loss. Because b is added into our prediction, any change to b directly changes our prediction. So what you can see here is the gradient of b with respect to our loss, the partial derivative, is just 21.98. It's the same as our loss gradient on y. And what this means is if we want to adjust our prediction and our, our error is too high, we adjust b in a similar way to reduce our error. Basically, what the partial derivative is helping us figure out is it's helping us figure out if I want to reduce the error, if I want to make this prediction closer to the actual value, how do I need to change b and w to get there? So this is the partial derivative with respect to b. Then we want to take the partial derivative with respect to w, which is a little bit more complicated because we're multiplying w by x before we add it to, to, get, to get our prediction. All right, so this bottom equation shows that we want to get our partial derivative of the loss with respect to our weight. And we can use something called the chain rule to basically say the partial derivative of the loss with respect to our weight is the same as the partial derivative with our loss with respect to x times w times the partial derivative of x times w with respect to w. And in this case, the partial derivative of the loss with respect to x times w is just 21.98. It's the same as with b. Since this is added to b to get our prediction, the partial derivative is the same as our gradient. OK, so what we do is we take 21.98, and then we multiply it by x. And the intuition here is that any change to our weight is multiplied by x before it impacts our prediction. So to get the gradient, we basically say, OK, our weight, if we change our weight, we multiply the changed weight by x to get our prediction. So our gradient 
is going to be our derivative of our loss, 21.98 times x, which in this case is 80. So we end up with 1,758. And we can visualize that with another image. So this shows us how we pull the gradient backwards and multiply by x to get the partial derivative with respect to w. All right, so these two numbers, 21.98 for b and 1,758 for w, are going to help us calculate how much we need to update these parameters to reduce the error. OK, so let's, let's try a first pass at doing that. All right, so we're going to define our weight values again. And this time, we'll go from negative 4,000 to 100 with a step of 100. And we'll define our losses. So this is the same thing we did before, where we calculated our loss. We're then going to scatter plot the weights and the losses. But this time, what we'll do is we'll plot our original weight, which was 1, and the loss for that weight in red. And then in green, we'll plot our new weight. So our new weight is going to be 1 minus the gradient of 1 comma y times 80. So it's, it's going to be 1758. And then we'll plot that. And we'll plot it in green. All right, so let's take a look. So our original weight is all the way on the right in red. And our new weight is all the way on the left in green. And you can see our loss actually increased. This is a plot of our loss. So our original loss was a lot lower than our new loss. So why did this happen? It happened because we took too big of a step when we adjusted our weight. Our weight went all the way down to negative 1,757, which if we look at our loss plot is going to create a giant loss because it's very, very far from our correct weight. So why did that happen? It's because we took the partial derivative at a single point where weight equaled 1. And we knew how quickly the loss function was changing at that point because, because we took the derivative. But the derivative changes a lot in between our, our point 1, where weight was 1, and our point where weight is negative 1,757. But the, the update we made wasn't aware of that. Right? It, we took so large a step because we were expecting the loss, the gradient, to not change between our original point and our new point, but it did change. So we need to account for the fact that the gradient of our function is changing as our weight changes. All right, so let's visualize how that gradient changes as our weight changes a little bit. So this is the same plot as above, except this time we're plotting the gradient instead of the loss. So let's, let's do that. And we can see we went from an area where the gradient was pretty low, close to zero, to an area where the gradient is a lot lower, because the gradient changed a lot in between those two points. So to adjust for the fact that the gradient's going to change, we use something called a learning rate. So a learning rate reduces the size of our parameter update. And this was our parameter update where we subtracted the partial derivative with respect to w from the original weight, it reduces the size of our parameter update so that we don't take too large of a step. All right. OK, so let's, let's plot our loss again, except this time what we're going to do is we're going to use a learning rate to make sure we don't take too large of a step. Okay, so we'll make our scatter plot again. And then we'll plot our original point. So we'll plot our loss here. And then we will plot our learning rate, which is going to be, we'll set it to a very, very small number, 0. 0.00005. Um, that's what the e negative 5 does. It says basically add a bunch of zeros in front of this number. And then we will calculate our new weight, which I will crib from up here. OK. 
Okay, which is based on the gradient, except this time we're multiplying by the learning rate to reduce our step size. And then we're going to plot the new weight, and then the new weight, we will plot the loss of the new weight and y. And we'll plot this in green. Okay, so we can see on this plot we can see the, the green dot over here. It's a little bit hard to see against the blue. And you can see the red dot over here. So when we reduced our step size, we actually moved towards the point where the loss is lower. So our new loss is now lower than our old loss because we used a learning rate to take a very, very small step instead of a giant step. So basically, we were moving in the right direction, we just moved way too far before, and the learning rate helps us move less far, so we don't get to a place where error actually increases. Okay, and we can take a look at our new weight, and it's now 0.91, so it's, it's moved down, but it's still not quite at the optimal weight. And this happens with gradient descent. Gradient descent is what's called an iterative algorithm. So you need to run it multiple times to actually converge towards the point where loss is the lowest. So if we were to continue this, we would, we would measure the gradient again with our new weight, and we would update our weight again and again and again until we got to the point where our loss is low enough or the algorithm has converged. And I'll talk a little bit more about that when we implement linear regression. Okay. So we now know enough about gradient descent to implement linear regression using gradient descent. The big difference is, in this example, we used a single data point to calculate the gradient and then update our parameters. When we implement linear regression, we're going to use all of our data to calculate the gradient. So what we'll essentially do is calculate the error for each individual training example. And if we go all the way back up to the top, remember we have 13,500 rows in our data. So we're going to make predictions for our whole data set. We will calculate the error for each row, and then we'll basically average the gradient to update our W and our B parameters. So we'll, we'll find the average error across all of our data, and we'll update the parameters to reduce the average error. And this will, this will fit the entire data set instead of just one training example. This is known as batch gradient descent. It is kind of weird that it's called batch. In linear regression, it's common to use batch gradient descent. With neural networks, it's more common to use something called stochastic gradient descent, where instead of averaging the gradient across all of your data, you average it either, you either take just a single example and train one example at a time, or you take a very, very small set of examples, like 30, and then you compute the gradient and make an update using that small batch. And I'll get into that in a later video when we talk about neural networks. But just know that here, we're gonna average the gradient across our entire data set. Okay, all right. So the first thing we'll do is we'll just set up our data to make it easier for us to build the algorithm. So we're gonna convert our data from panda, a pandas data frame into NumPy arrays. So what split data is doing is it's gonna split our data up into three sets. We're going to have a training set, which we'll use to train our algorithm. We'll have a validation set, which we'll use to measure how well the algorithm is doing as we're training it. And then we'll have a test set, which we'll do a final evaluation on. The reason for three splits is it's very, very easy to tune your learning rate and other parameters as you're training and in turn, make your algorithm perform better on the validation set. But you wanna do a final evaluation on a test set, not on a set that you've been optimizing the parameters on because that will lead to overfitting. Okay. Looks like I missed a, a line when I was copying here. All right, let's run that. Okay, so we now have three data sets. And we can go ahead and start training our linear regression algorithm. So we need four pieces to build the algorithm. The first thing we need is a way to initialize our weights and our biases. So we wanna make initial guesses about what the correct weight and bias is so that we can then tell the algorithm to start iterating. 
The second thing we need to do is write a function that makes predictions. Then we need to write some functions that will measure the loss and the gradient. And finally, we need a backward pass that will update the parameters based on our loss. Okay. So we will start out by writing a function called init params predictors. So it's going to take in the number of predictors that we have. In this case, we're using three predictors, tmax, tmin, and rain. So we need to initialize three weights, one for each of our predictors and one bias. Okay. So we're going to set a random seed. The re reason we set this is if you don't set it, your weights and biases will initialize differently every time, and your algorithm will perform a little bit differently every time just, just due to that initialization. But if we run this twice, we want it to perform the same, because otherwise it's really hard to actually debug the algorithm. So we're going to go ahead and initialize our weights. So we will initialize our weights to random numbers between zero and one and we will initialize three of them, one for each of our predictors. And then I'm going to call this biases, but we're really just initializing one bias in this case. I'm calling it biases because with linear regression, you can predict multiple targets. And if you have multiple targets, you would want multiple biases. But in this case, obviously, we're just predicting Tmax tomorrow. And in this function, we'll just go ahead and return our weights and our biases. So we can actually call this and pass in our number of predictors, and you can see how the parameters have been initialized. Our bias is just one, and our weights are between zero and one. They're random numbers. Okay, now we need to write what's called a forward pass for our algorithm. And the forward pass is going to make predictions using our weights and our biases. So our weights and our biases are stored in the list params. So we'll just pull those out into separate variables. And then what we're going to do is we're going to say our prediction equals our X values matrix multiplied by our weights. So the at symbol is a new symbol in Python. It's the matrix multiplication symbol. And if you're not familiar with matrix multiplication, well, basically what this is doing is it's multiplying each predictor by each weight. So it's basically going to calculate this. W1 times Tmax plus W2 times Tmin plus W3 times Rain. And then it's going to add in our bias, and that will give us our prediction. The exact same as the linear regression equation we looked at earlier. And then we'll just go ahead and return our prediction. So pretty straightforward on the forward pass. Then we need to figure out how good is our prediction. We need to calculate our loss and our gradient. So I'm going to define two functions, one called MSE. So that's just mean squared error. We're going to take the mean, the actual minus the predicted, and we will square that actual minus predicted as well. So remember, we're, we're training with multiple data points. So we're just going to take the mean of our, of our error across our data set. And then for our gradient, we're just going to return predicted minus actual. Now it's correct actually to multiply this by two. I'm not going to multiply it by two because it's easier to not do that and just adjust the learning rate instead of multiplying this by two. It gives us a little bit more flexibility. So this will calculate our gradient. And we can pass multiple examples into this. We can actually pass all, all 13,000 rows or however many rows are in our training set, and it'll return one error per, per row, essentially. Okay, now the, the trickiest part is the backward pass. So this is going to take in our parameters, our input X values, our learning rate, and our gradient. And then what we're going to do is we're going to calculate the partial derivative with respect to W, which is just going to be our X values multiplied by our gradient values. So this will be X1 times G, comma, X2 times G, comma, X3 times G. So we'll end up with one value for each of our weights that we can use to update our weights. All right, and the reason we divide by x dot shape is because we're doing batch gradient descent. 
we want to essentially average our X values across our entire data set before we make the updates. So that, that's what this is doing. It's averaging our X values. Okay. And then what we want to do is also find our B gradient. So our gradient on our bias term. So that's just the mean of our gradient. As we saw before, uh, we take the mean and then we actually update our B value using that mean. So the gradient at this point is just going to be a single number. So what this axis equals zero is doing is just averaging across all of our training data. So all of our rows, or the gradient for all of our rows just gets averaged. Okay, then we're going to update our weights by taking W grad times learning rate. And then we're going to update our biases by doing B grad times learning rate. And then we'll just return our parameters. So this is the exact same thing we did before in this diagram when we calculated the gradients and then we use them to update our W and B values. Okay, so that's our backward pass. Now we can actually go ahead and write what's called a training loop. So this is really common when you're using gradient descent, uh, when you're training neural networks. You basically write a loop that passes the data into the algorithm over and over until your error gets to a point where it's low enough. And each time you pass the data into the algorithm is called an epoch. So we're gonna run for 100 epochs with the learning rate 1 e negative 4. And we're going to initialize our parameters. This is just going to be 3. This is the number of predictors that we, that we want to use. And then what we're going to say is for i in range epochs, so we're going to loop each epoch, we're going to loop across the entire data set. So we're going to make predictions. We're going to make predictions for our whole data set. So we'll get one prediction for every row in our training data. We're going to calculate our gradient given our train y and our predictions. And then we're going to update our parameters using our backward pass. Remember, we're doing batch gradient descent, so we're, we're just operating across the whole data set. Okay, and then what we'll do is we'll say if i modulus 10 equals equals zero, then we'll actually print out our validation error. And then we will calculate our mean squared error given our validation predictions. And then we can just print that out. Okay, so that's our training loop. And if you work with neural networks, you'll be writing a lot of these training loops. I, may, I named this epic instead of epics. So let's go ahead and run this. Okay, so we can see we can see that it's printing out our validation loss. And we can see that the validation loss is decreasing as our epic count gets higher and higher, which is exactly what you want with gradient descent, right? Every time you run through gradient descent, you're, you're descending this curve and you're getting closer and closer to that point of minimum loss. So let's try really upping our epic count. So we'll up this to a thousand and then we'll print out every hundred epics. And we can see the more epochs we run for, the lower error gets. But the more it gets, it starts reducing more and more slowly. And that's because of, of this, right? The shape. So when your weight is, for example, three, you can update your weight and get a huge reduction in loss. But as you get closer and closer to the bottom, changes in your weight get smaller and the corresponding loss decreases get smaller also. So we say an algorithm is converged when the loss stops changing that much. So here you can see that the algorithm is starting to converge. The initial updates are, are very, very big. The loss goes down fast, and then it starts going down very, very slowly. So if you added more and more epics, you would notice that the loss goes down more and more slowly. So if we up this to, let's say, 5,000, and let's print out every 500, so we can, we can start to see that the loss is still decreasing, but it gets slower and slower and slower, right? Where it's pretty much the same in these last few runs. 
All right, so that is the gradient descent algorithm. Now you have to be really careful with your learning rate in gradient descent. So let's take a look at what happens if we set our learning rate too high. So let's say we set our learning rate to one E negative two. You can see that our loss quickly goes to infinity. That's because our parameters are too big because the algorithm is stepping too far and you wanna make sure you get the correct learning rate so that it doesn't do that. And if you set your learning rate too low, the algorithm will just not learn, right? It'll, the loss will reduce very, very, very slowly. So it can take some experimentation to really find the correct learning rate. And you wanna just make sure you, you experiment with that. Okay, another area you can experiment with is how you initialize the weights and the biases. For example, you could divide the weights by two or you could just subtract 0.5. This would rescale the weights from negative 0.5 to positive 0.5, which can make a big difference in your outcome. So let's take a look at, at how that looks. So it can change how the descent happens and how quickly it happens and how quickly the algorithm converges. You can also add a regularization term in here, which, which would create something called a ridge regression. So you would, in this case, add in an additional parameter to the update, which would be a function of the original weight. And that would make it so that your weights don't get too large. Okay, one last thing before I jump off. Let's take a look at the parameters of our final model. So we can see what our final weights were and our final bias. And we can compare this to what came out of scikit-learn. In this case, in scikit-learn, we only trained with a single predictor with Tmax, but you could train with all of the predictors and compare them. All right. So today we learned a really, really important building block of neural networks, gradient descent. A lot of the concepts you learned today, like the forward pass and the backward pass are also directly applicable to neural networks. So in the next tutorial, when we talk about neural networks, all of this will be relevant. And it's actually not a lot more code to go from this to a neural network. All right, hope you enjoyed this tutorial and hopefully I'll see you next time.